Let me introduce you to our next speaker by saying that measuring UX is one of those things that, you know, when you're in UX, it's something that usually you would like to do, but it can be really tricky to actually perform, right? Because especially in organizations with low UX maturity, there's always something else coming up and it's often deprioritized. And even when it is prioritized, finding a way to do it, like how do you measure UX can be really, really tricky to come by. So luckily with us today, we have Javier here, who has been uh, working for Google for quite a while. And Google has this framework called the Heart Framework. And it's a tool that's open for people to use, and he will talk us through it a little bit today. He himself has had a career in UX for over 20 years. Like I said, working at Google, first at Google Cloud, now moving on to Google Play. And he's also been affiliated with the University of Basel, where he built up the Human Computer Interaction Lab. So let's give it up for Javier. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the warm welcome. It's so good to be here on such a large stage. It reminds me of my old rock and roll past where I was on stage. So it's, it's good to be back. Um, my name is Javier. Um, and although my name doesn't reveal it, I am a Swiss. My parents are from Argentina. So yes, we're world champions. Thank you. And um, I, I work for Google in Zurich uh, for more than 12 years. I've been in different uh, parts of Google. Um, and uh, since one and a half years, I'm Google Play, and before that, in Google Cloud. And in Cloud, we spend a lot of time thinking through how we can measure the user experience, because we were flying blind when it comes to users. We were really good in measuring a lot of the business and the engineering metrics, but we were flying blind on UX. Um, so I worked a lot with my team, which was quantitative UX researchers, uh, together with data scientists and business analysts on moving this forward. And this uh, talk um, shows you, gives you like some tools that you can use in your um, job if you want to mature your organization and move a little bit uh, towards having better metrics for users. So. When we are in the context of a product that uh, we're developing, we always want to know how well we're doing, right? And we do this, ho hopefully, always through metrics, right? Success metrics. So what is a success metric? Like, when do we know that we're successful? In a most simple form, we can say that a success metrics is an algorithm that measures performance. We want to know how we're doing. And are we doing this? Hopefully, yes. And here's a bunch of stuff that many companies get right. Uh, we might have things such as page views and clicks, and is, is my product up and running? Is it fast, latency, right? Do we have users? Do we make money? Like these kind of things we always measure, right? And we always look at it like you might have, depending on what the setup is, like business reviews, like quarterly business review, where you look at those metrics, or maybe monthly, right, to so make sure everything is going well. So we're getting this well in most cases. Um, and the reason for this is that these are product and engineering metrics. And so engineers, they're in charge to figure out if like, the products are running well, right? So they will measure something like latency, right? And, uh, and business wants to know if we're making money, so obviously they're measuring that. So all these kind of things are usually reported, um, but the UX side is missing. So if we spin that, if we continue to spin that thought, um, we are in the field of UX metrics. And what is a UX success metric? It's the same, right? It's just a user-centered algorithm to measure performance. So here, we're looking at the behavioral, the user side, and we want to know how our products are doing. And that's important because as we mature in the field and we want to make sure that UX is like an equal partner in product development together with PM and Eng, right? we also need to bring UX to a place where we have metrics that show if we're successful uh, with what we're doing and if our products are doing well when it comes to users. And that's kind of like the field that I have spent a lot of time in and that I'm going to talk here about. So if we are... Um, we want to embark on this adventure to create UX metrics. 
um, then we need to know what is the goal. The goal of implementing, creating, defining, implementing, and reporting UX metrics is that we want to track user-centered metrics to know how we're doing and to know if we're moving towards the company goals that we have defined. So these UX metrics are not just there for the sake of them, they're here to understand how we're doing now, and they're here to derive conclusions that help us to shape the future of a product and to know if there's something that we need to improve or if we're just doing fine. There, there are challenges when we're thinking about metrics, and that's not UX metrics specific. That's in general for metrics. Metrics are never perfect, right? If you define them badly, then you will measure garbage, and you will take wrong conclusions and wrong actions, right? So defining metrics well is super important, and defining a set of metrics that give you a holistic picture about what is going on is important, because else you're flying blind or you're flying like with the wrong data and therefore will take uh, wrong decisions. So that challenge is always a part of defining metrics and in the field of UX where there's less experience with that, even more. And I'll give you an example so you understand what I'm talking about. Imagine this is the chart for your 30-day active users for your product, right? So you have numbers of users and you have time and it's growing. Right? So you have more users. Is this a happy story? If you look at this, if this would be your product, you'd likely say, yes, right? We're growing. Growing is good. Everybody wants growth. So thumbs up. We're doing well. Let's continue uh, the way we're doing now, and everything is fine. The problem with this metric is that this metric could be composed of two metrics, which is new users and existing users. And if you look at it that way, you'll see that you're actually growing really rapidly. You're adding a lot of new users into the funnel, but you're also losing them. Your existing users are going down. You have churn, right? Now, suddenly, that story is no longer happy, because apparently, you're doing a really good job bringing new people into the product, so sales, marketing, whatever, is doing a good job, but then users try it out, and then they leave. Right? Now you have a problem. You need to figure out why are users leaving, because it's expensive to acquire them, and if we lost them, then it's all in vain. Right? So if you have those two metrics instead of only one, you get a better picture. And that's exactly one of the things that you need to think through when you think about UX metrics, which are the metrics that we need to get to a more or less complete picture that allows us to have a holistic view about what is happening on our product when it comes to users. So if we think through these things, the question is, who is in charge to create UX metrics? Is it someone's job? And my answer to that is clearly us. We, you, we all were in charge for that, right? This is not something that you can suppose that PM is in charge for, because they're the owner of the product. Right? They, they are basically in charge for everything. We are in charge of UX metrics, the same way a, product, uh, a PM is in charge for product metrics, and an engineering lead will be in charge for the engine metrics. Right? So it's our job to create consensus, to get buy-in, to secure resources that we can build those UX metrics, measure them, track them, understand them, and then take actions. So um, how do we go about this? If we want to define metrics for our products, um, how do we do this? Um, there's two really useful concepts here that you need to have in mind. Goals and signals. A goal is something that is defined by the business, right? Here's how do we want users to engage with our product, right? Because we have certain goals as a business, and we can think through, like, which behavior um, are we actually trying to generate, right? So that's the goal. The signal is what behavior changes would signal that we're moving in the right direction. Because users are doing something, they're showing a behavior in the product, and which changes in behavior would signal that we're going in this direction. I'll give you an example, an old example of Google, um, which is called the long click. 
<laughs> this example is from the beginning from, uh, from Google, when Google was a search engine only. Um, and uh, Larry and Sergey um, had defined the goal that users should find what they need on the first try, the first click. That would be the goal, because the best, the, th that would be a signal that we're giving them what they need, right? Nobody is going to Google because they enjoy using Google. They're actually looking for something that is typically outside of Google. So that was the goal. Now, what behavior would indicate that this is happening? What they defined as a signal is the so-called long click. That is the length of time that passes by before people come back to search. The longer this metric would be, the more likely it is that we gave people what they wanted and they didn't have to come back to, to Google search to click to another link, right? So it's almost counterintuitive because you're actually trying people to get away from your product, right? And you're measuring that time. Um, and that was a, a very successful metric, which has been used for a long period of time. I don't know if it's still used uh, nowadays because I'm not in search. Um, but it's a, it, it's a metric that was really successful because it was actually measuring if we were achieving uh, this goal of people finding what they need on the first try. Okay. Um, if you want to think through metrics, there is a framework that was developed at Google and that was published, and I hope most of you already know it. Um, it's called the HART framework. And HART stands for these five categories of UX metrics that shine a different light on user experience. Um, we have happiness, so do people enjoy using the product? We have engagement, do they use the product like deeply and broadly? Uh, do they use the different things that we're offering? Um, adoption, do they like start using the product, but also start using different aspects, products, services um, of the product? Um, retention, do they stay? Do they continue using our product? And then task success, on a task level, are they able to complete what um, they are here for easily, efficiently, effectively? These are categories that will help you to think through different aspects of the user experience and to define goals and to define signals that would indicate that we are doing well or not. Um, here is an example of how that could look like for a music streaming app. And this is a made up example, so this is not from uh, YouTube Music. I don't work for YouTube Music. I just made this up, uh, just to be clear. Um, so you have those five categories, happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, task success, and then you have goals defined for each of these categories. So happiness means people are enjoying using the app. That would be the goal. You want users to be happy. What are signals that would indicate that this is actually happening? We could use, and these are examples, there could be more. Um, these are just examples. We have like, we could measure in product satisfaction, a survey, five-star rating in the app, so you, that would indicate if they're happy or not. Um, you could also say, well, we have a recommender feature in the app where I can recommend this app to a friend. Right? Using that recommender feature is a signal that people are actually happy. They're recommending this to someone else. So you could measure that, the usage of that recommender feature, as a positive signal. You can also look at stuff that is already there. For instance, the ratings on the Play Store, which come for free, and they're there. So if that's high, it's a sign that people are happy. Right? So these are examples. Um, engagement means people use the app often. Right? So for a music streaming app, you could say, like, well, we measure the time that they spend listening to music. That's certainly a signal that people are engaging, right? You could also look at other things. Are they creating playlists that tailor the, their experience to what they actually need would also be a sign of engagement, and there's obviously a lot more. Adoption would be that they start using the app, but they also start using aspects of the app. You could say, okay, we have like a number of users of our free tier, but we also measure number of users that move from free to paid. That would be a, a signal that they're adopting, that they're buying into the ecosystem. They're now giving us money to listening to uh, the music. Retention means they stay. Here, right before, you see like 30-day actives, right? For a music streaming app, that's likely not such a good metric, right? Because you want people to listen to music more often than once 
per month. So maybe you say it's a seven-day active. Maybe you measure even daily active users, assuming that people often listen to music every day. Um, you could also look at app deletions. That's a very terminal signal of retention, right? I'm deleting the app from my phone. I will no longer use you. There's possibly no stronger signal for that that something went wrong in retention. And then finally, task success. So you want people to uh, be successful in the things that they're doing with the app. Uh, for instance, you could say a search that translates to a music stream is a successful task. You're searching for something, then you're actually listening to it. Good job. These are examples, right? So this framework helps you to think through your concrete product, what could be goals and signals that are important for us to measure the experience. And once that you have that, the true magic starts. Because now you can start triangulating metrics. And by triangulating, we mean that you're using a bunch of those metrics together to create that full picture, to understand what's happening. And I'll give you an example, again, in this made up example of the music app. Let's say we are, um, we are having a new version of our music streaming app. That's B. And we have A, which is our existing one. We have we have rolled it out to a certain amount of users, um, and we're measuring those UX metrics for both, the existing one and the new one. And we're looking at revenue, and we see revenue is more or less the same, so things are going well with this new version. Um, everything is great, right? We continue looking at satisfaction, and we do see that satisfaction was not the same in the beginning, when we launched it, maybe there was some change aversion, right? Things were new, people were trying to uh, understand it, so they were not that happy. But then, after a short period of time, they figured it out and satisfaction recovered, but then it dropped again. So now we're like, okay, we can't launch this version. Like, we don't want to launch a new version that has people less satisfied, so what is happening? You continue looking, you look at adoption, you see there's no difference in adoption. Things uh, seem to be fine there. And then you look at task success, and you see that in one of the signals that you defined, which is a search that translates into a music stream, we seem to have a problem. In the beginning, it was a bit less, then it recovered, and suddenly it's low. Like, we have a lot less searches that translate to a music stream. So maybe we have a problem in the search algorithm. Maybe our user interface is clunky, is something we introduced that is confu confusing. Something is happening there that leads users to uh, listen to less music based on a search. Now we can go and investigate. Your metrics will never tell you why something is happening, right? Quant metrics never do that. Quant metrics tell you what's happening. Now you need to go and figure out why it's happening. Maybe you do qual research. Maybe you look into the logs. Maybe you look like into your search algorithm. Like you try to understand what is happening, but at least you know you're no longer flying blind. You know that you need to investigate, figure this out before you can launch this new version. So that's how metrics can be used together to triangulate and, and create insights. All right, if you use this, a couple of things, a couple of questions that come up, a couple of, uh, of side notes. It is really important that you choose the signals that indicate goal success and not what is just readily available. This is a conversation that I had and I'm having very often with engineers, with product owners, where we were like, okay, we would like to measure this. And they go like, well, we're not measuring this, but we're measuring this, that's good enough. Right? And we're like, no, that's just convenience because you have it, but it's actually not measuring what we want at all. Right? So we do need to figure out how can we measure this signal that really indicates uh, our success and not just what is readily available. Another thing is that you don't need metrics for all those categories. Right? The Heart Framework has five categories, and the question is often, well, do we need to have metrics for all of them? And the answer is no. And because of two reasons, right? First of all, sometimes there are some of those categories that make no sense. If you work, for instance, for an internal tool that is used in a company and people have to use it, you don't need to measure adoption, right? Because it's forced usage, right? So why would you measure that? Um, so if you see that one of those categories just doesn't make sense in your context, then just leave it, leave it out and don't do it. 
Um, the other, the other um, thing is that if you're not measuring anything nowadays and you define your metrics and then you go, go to your stakeholders and you're like, here's these 15 things that we need to instrument and measure, they might laugh you out of the room. And then you lost because then you have nothing, right? So instead of that, you can also say, well, we'll define which are the most two important categories or three, right? And then maybe one signal per category. And then you do know what you would like to measure in the future, but you're not asking for all of that at once. You're first asking for the most important ones, and then you can scale and ask for more, right? So don't, don't um, lose everything just because you want everything at once. You also don't need multiple metrics per category. I, I gave you a couple of signals per category as examples, right? But that's not like um, what is needed. It depends on your product, right? You are in charge for the experience of your product. You know your users the best, right? Think through what makes sense, and maybe it's one signal, and that's enough, fine. And the last point is, if you do this, it's really important that you, th that you think, before you even implement those metrics, how will you use them, right? We have so many dead dashboards at Google, you cannot believe, right? You invest so much time in measuring and creating, and then there's a dashboard, and you send it out, and then nobody ever looks at it. That's useless. That's a waste of money. It's a waste of resources. So if you're measuring UX, then you need to look at these metrics together with business metrics, together with engineering metrics. So in those meetings where you have the reviews, where you look at those metrics, there needs to be the section where you walk people through your UX metrics. And if there's no buy-in for that, if there's no commitment to that, you do not have to measure UX. Continue flying blind. At least you're not wasting the money to create those metrics. Right? So this is part of getting consensus to, buy, to build those metrics, is like, where are we going to look at them? Right? And then define that and do it. There's two important laws from people that are much smarter than me um, that work in this field. There's person's law um, that is important to have in mind. Um, person says uh, that which is measured improves and which is measured and reported improves exponentially. So when you're, that means that when you're creating metrics and you start reporting and looking at them, right, you will do things to improve those metrics. That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? That's why you're measuring stuff, right? But that also means there might be a moment in time when a metric ceases to be helpful, right? And I'll give you an example that maybe some of you can relate to. User satisfaction is a metric that very often is useless, right? So you measure if your customers are happy with your product, and for most, in most cases, that metric will be, will be somewhere between four and five on a five-point Likert scale if you're not doing, creating an awful product, right? It will be somewhere there, right? And as long as this user satisfaction metric is between four and five, things are fine, right? That means it's not super helpful. It only becomes helpful if it drops, right? If it drops suddenly below four, you're like 3.5, like what the hell is going on, right? That's when you need to investigate. So there is kind of like that aspect of a metric that is optimized where at the end you'll look at it and just like thumbs up, continue. Goodhart's law says that when a metric becomes a target, it ceases to be a good metric. And what Goodhart means is that if you are like, okay, we want to optimize this metric, right? Um, then what you're doing is a selective optimization of one metric, and it might go at the expense of other things, right? And an example I use here is like YouTube. If you imagine YouTube, YouTube is an ecosystem where you have viewers, you have creators of videos, and you have advertisers, right? You could say, well, our goal is to create the maximum amount of money for our creators and Google. Hence, we will flood the system with ads, right? But if we flood the system with ads, which would be our goal, and we look at revenue, it might look like we're optimizing for this. But now we're annoying the viewers, and our watch time will drop, and our revenue will drop in the long term and we like, damaged our ecosystem, right? So a single metric optimization is never a good thing. That's why you have multiple metrics. That's why you should look at your experience holistically and not only try to optimize for one metric. That also means we need to revisit our metrics. We need to ask critical questions. Um, 
every half a year and say, like, are these still the right metrics? Do we need to add something? Do we need to remove something? It's not a static set of metrics that we can look at. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so, oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. We tried to implement. Uh, I mean, when I say we, one of my former places, we talked a lot about heart and measuring, imp measuring UX, but it never really got quite to the level that you have <laughs> shared with us just now. Um, any questions from you all? One in the back. Let's hear it. And while we're waiting for the mic, these are some links if you want to go to scientific publications or a blog post about that, uh, about the heart framework. Um, my question would be, which framework do you suggest for B2B software? Yes, a very good question. So you, for, I, I worked a lot in B2B, right? So I, I, I worked in ads and I worked in cloud almost for 10 years in total. Um, so you can use hard for B2B. Um, you can adopt it. Um, it's not um, necessarily everything in there. Uh, we have adopted the hard framework internally for B2B, and it's called Super Framework. Um, so it's a little bit more adopted to B2B. I don't know if it was published externally, so I can figure that out. But my, my main message here is like, if you see some needs to adopt the framework for a more enterprise context, you can do that. There's many teams who apply hard directly for B2B, um, also at Google. So I, I don't think it, that it doesn't work, but it might need some tweaking depending on your context. Thank you. Sure. We have time for one more question. Yeah, over here in the middle. There was also one over there. Hi. Hello. Hello. Oh, yep. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much. For uh, keep it close to you <laughs> here. Yes. Okay, now it is. Um, I was thinking if you have any advice for uh, teams where we cannot, uh, we don't find the right um, alleys, maybe, um, to, let's go a little bit back. You were saying that we need to find the right um, signals, right, mm -hmm. to make sure that, uh, that we have the focus and we have the, the, yeah, the metrics uh, to focus on. But what happens when or we don't have uh, we don't have the the or the space or the tools or the time maybe um, mm -hmm. to to focus on 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 this. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm I think yeah, to, I'm a to, little bit nervous. To get buy-in to actually measure the UX. Uh, yeah, that what way. do we do in, the, in those cases when we are maybe not working for Google? We have like yeah, yeah. <laughs> little teams. Yeah. Uh, well, welcome to UX, right? It's, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's the ongoing battle where you um, are trying to convince your organization that focusing on users and in the next step measuring uh, the user experience is important, right? And um, so depending what company you are, you're in different maturity levels and so on. So that's what I meant before when I said, well, don't go for everything, right? I, maybe you start small and go like, okay, we'll measure one thing, right, as a first step. Let's measure satisfaction, which is often something that like, cross-functional stakeholders can buy in more easily. Or measure something else, right? So you, you can show them the plan, this is what we would like to measure, but instead of going like, this is everything, you start small and go like, let's get one metric into our business reviews so we look at users, right? And um, I, I, there is not an easy solution for this, like there's no trick to convince your stakeholders, right? At the end, it is like that ongoing battle that UXers have um, with cross-functional stakeholders to, to convince people that it's important to measure uh, the UX and to, to focus on, on user experience. So you'll have to just not give up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give up. What a good way yeah. to, to end this moment. I think we're going to wrap it up here, of course. Again, if you have any questions, he will be here for the rest yeah, of the day. Yeah, I'm around. Just come to me. Exactly. Thank you. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you so much, Javier. <laughs>